including the Jewish rabbis, refuses to appear on God's holy, sanctified Sabbath day. And yes, the Sabbath day is holy. And you, all you denominations, refuse 
and continue to neglect and refuse to keep the Sabbath day on the seventh day in half the world. Well, into the tribulation you go, Living Church of God, United Church of God, Philadelphia Church of God, Triumph Prophetic Ministries, Church of God and the Eternal, all of you, into the tribulation you go, because you can't even get the fourth commandment right. You go by a phony 1883 dateline. In 1880, everyone waited for the sun to go down for the Sabbath day to start. In 1883, everyone had the Sabbath day on Friday in half the world. Is that so hard to understand that you have to wait for the sun to go down, Living Church of God, Meredith? Is that too hard for you to understand, Meredith, that you have to wait for the sun to go down? Is that too hard for you to understand, Brisby, that you have to wait for the sun to go down? It's too hard for you to understand, Dankenbrink, that you have to wait for the sun to go down? It's too hard for you, Fleury, to understand you have to wait for the sun to go down? What's the matter with you ministers? Give your head a shake. If you can't understand, then get rebaptized. Because like Peter, Peter couldn't follow Christ until after he was given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit these days is given by the laying on of hands after you're rebaptized. Obviously you need to be rebaptized because you can't figure this out. You can't figure it out that you've got to wait for the sun to go down. You've got to wait six sundowns before you start the Sabbath day in the other half of the world. Now we've got the proof that we are following God because we have the Pakistani church of 200 plus brethren and they wait for the sun to go down as they're instructed to by God in the Bible and as we have taught them. So that's why God gave us that congregation because it is the farthest congregation going west around the earth before you hit Jerusalem again. So, you ministers out there are disobedient and if you can't understand, that means you don't have God's Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit gives you the wisdom and the understanding. Not only that, you celebrate Sky Father's Day, the longest day of the year, but you'll say, oh, we don't celebrate Christmas, the shortest day of the year, in honor of Baal, but yeah, we'll celebrate. So, We'll celebrate Sky Father's Day, the longest day of the year. And then you'll celebrate the Spring Festival of Mother Goddess Day to your dear sweet mother. And you will love your mother more than God. He who loves his mother more than God shall not enter the kingdom. If you don't hang up on your mother on Mother Goddess Day, after telling her for years that you don't celebrate it and that you give her gifts or presents or recognize her 364 other days, if you say to your mother, thank you for calling me on Mother Goddess Day, or the same thing on Sky Father's Day, you thank your children for calling you on Sky Father's Day, then you will not be in the kingdom of God. And I can say that on the authority of the Bible, that he who loves his children more than he loves God will not be in the kingdom of God. Pretty serious. And then you have Turkey God Day. You have an extra day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Why don't you have an extra day of Pentecost? Have two days of Pentecost. See how foolish you are? Well, this is the obedient church of God. And we are going to put you ministers on the line. And you're the problem, you ministers. You're the wolves. You're the wolves that are changing God's Bible. You ministers, Brisby, you're going against God's Bible. Dankenbrink, you're going against God's Bible. Flurry, you're going against God's Bible. Meredith, you're going against God's Bible. Luca, you're going against God's Bible. You have to wait till the seventh day to have God's Sabbath, not have it on Friday in half the world. Repent. 
Repent all you churches. Well, today's broadcast, we're going to be giving you more information about the world situation. We'll give you information about the terrible event of the people all being, children and adults being shot in, what was it, 27 of them was shot. Why were 27 of them shot? Answer, because seven of the teachers didn't have any guns. Now, if the seven teachers that were shot dead had guns, then the 20 children wouldn't have been shot dead. And they themselves wouldn't have been shot dead. Because they would have shot the jerk, the 20-year-old kid who was shooting everybody. The problem is the teachers didn't have guns. This is the situation. This is the society we're living into. in. Anyone who tells you that you should ban guns and that'll solve the problem is a fool and a liar. Because the nutcases and the criminals will always have guns. They always will. Just like in Prohibition. So you had Prohibition, everybody was still drinking, they were even drinking more. Because now they were making bathtub gin. The only way things can change is with Yeshua coming back. And until he comes back, you need guns to protect yourself from the maniacs out there. I'll be telling you more about that. We'll also give you a history of the United States secret operations. And as it today is New Moon Day, guess what we're going to do on our solemn feast day? I think some of you might know. Yes, it's the most magnificent shofar in the whole world. And this is what you do on your solemn feast day to announce the meeting. December the 15th and you are commanded to appear before God on, and worship on New Moon Day Ezekiel 46 3 you shall worship on New Moon Day and if you refuse to worship on New Moon Day then you are a disobedient devil because you can read Clearly, in your Bible, it says you shall worship on New Moon Day. Right next to you shall worship on the Sabbath day. Every new moon and every Sabbath, you shall worship. We have new listeners out there. It's very important to know that New Moon Day is part of God's way of life. And God's way of life inculcates into you obedience, step by step by step. 
And when you start attending his Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times a year, three feasts of ye a year, three, three, three feasts a year, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacles, then when you start becoming obedient, then, then you can have a relationship with God. But it doesn't happen before that, no matter what you want to say, when you're deliberately disobedient. So let's read it together. It's New Moon Day, Ezekiel 46.3. Ezekiel 46, 3, dot, the people, dot, shall worship, dot, 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 on, here it comes, dot, dot, the new moons. What's so difficult to understand about those words? The people shall worship on the new moons. Well, welcome to New Moon Day, our solemn feast day in tribute to Father creating the whole universe. And we are worshiping on a high Sabbath today because it not only is New Moon Day, it's a Sabbath day. It's a seventh day Sabbath, so that makes this a special high day. Well, now that we have got you initiated into God's way, all you new listeners. Just the one or two basics that make us the only obedient church of God on the face of the earth. And that's proven by the facts that we don't move God's Sabbath to Friday in half of the world. That we do celebrate New Moon Day. That we don't celebrate Mother Goddess Day, Sky Father's Day, Turkey God Day. And that makes us obedient and that makes you disobedient. And the disobedient shall have their part in the lake of fire whether you say so or not. Because Revelation 21, 27 says any minister who teaches you to practice a lie will be thrown in the lake of fire. And having the Sabbath day on Friday in half the world is a lie. And having the pagan goddess day, the mother of all gods, is a lie. Having Sky Father's Day is a lie. Having Turkey God Day is a lie. Not only that, it's adding a day to God's Feast of Tabernacles, which is a, another heinous crime that you refuse to repent of, Dankenbrink. It's not going to end. God will say the same thing to you. What is wrong with you? Deuteronomy 12, 32. Do not add or subtract anything to the Bible. Do not add. So what makes you think that you can add? Get rebaptized, Dankenbrink. You got a big problem, along with Meredith and Luker, Flurry, and all the rest of them. Well, today we're going to be discussing, teaching you about Yeshua and his appearances and his temptation and how you can overcome your temptations. But first, we want to offer our praise to Father because this is a worship service. So all please rise, face the north heavens where Yeshua and Father are. And first we're going to open with prayer and introduce ourselves to Father. So head bowed, eyes closed. Almighty and most merciful, powerful Father, you who created and control the moons, the moon and all of the planets, Indeed, the whole galaxy, praise be to you. Thank you for the knowledge in your scriptures of New Moon Day so that we can have a special emphasis on your great creation on New Moon Day and a reflection on New Moon Day. Thank you for this special high Sabbath of New Moon Day and the seventh day. Father, we petition you to give us the ability to get this word out as your servant. 
choose who you wish, but we petition you, he said, here am I, and we petition you to get the word out, because we are zealous, zealous for your word. So please consider us. Now, Father, please inspire the services, both the hearing and the speaking, and especially the hearing on the videotapes when most people listen. And look after the brethren in Pakistan, the 200 plus of them, find a way to feed them as funds are very tight now because you know what's going on with the government against us and what we're dealing with. So, Father, we put ourselves in the hollow of your hand. We ask this all in Yeshua's holy righteous name and ask you to bless this broadcast in Yeshua's name. Yeshua HaMashiach, our soon arriving King of the world. Amen. Now that we're in God's throne room, first thing we want to do is praise Him. So take your beautiful 1934 hymnals, the words of them in the beautiful fuchsia color, that we printed down the words from the ninth, original 1934 because they're more succinct. For camera one, camera two. Very important, very important that you use the 1934 words because they drive home the message. Now, we've got a new set of hymns because it's New Moon Day and every month we choose a new set of hymns. And we sing these four because every month we have a different theme. They're really, if you run a corporation, you know that you've got to have structure. You've got to have structure. So this, this theme is now all on relying on God, especially with December the 21st coming up. So remain standing, turn to page number... 20, page 22 in other hymnals, To Thee I Lift My Soul, To Thee I Lift My Soul. And please sing out, because the words are, Let me not be ashamed. So, don't you be ashamed to sing out. You want to praise Father. It's very important because this is part of your sacrifice. The sacrifice is the fruit of your lips. So don't embarrass yourself. Don't give a poor sacrifice. Sing out.
saying, ouch, because you petition Father to, these are the words you sang, my sins and faults of youth do thou, O Lord, forget. See how important these hymns are? And then you asked him to think on you. You said the words, after thy mercies, think on me. Now, if you're not singing out, you are only harming yourself. So get off your couch, get off your couch, and sing out. We've got a good one for you now, because we want to return to, Oh, how love I thy law. And that is important for you to tell Father. So that you, 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 can be in harmony with his way of life and not be one of part of 4,000 different religions that are all doing something different, worshiping on the sixth day of the week instead of the seventh day and half of the world, hmm. adding devil days like Turkey God Day, Ra Osiris, who sprang forth from the egg that the cosmic goose laid. That's why you've got a turkey on your table to represent that pagan deity centerpiece, a pagan deity sitting on your table. I do like that. You're going to do that in honor of God. Well, you shall not learn the way of the Gentile. Is that clear? That's in God's law. That's in God's law. It's also in Jeremiah 10 too. So, oh how I love I thy law. I'll sing out in praise of the Father. him just like you just said from thy judgments never let me depart now you're going to say to father and Yeshua Lord teach me that I may know so sing out in praise and worship and in humble obedience to
teach me that I may know what a wonderful song. All these songs are in the public domain, composed by Dwight Armstrong, that was Ross Judston on the keyboards, and it's wonderful to be singing the songs with an understanding, an understanding of what you are singing, and that's why I bring out the comments so that you can understand. Well, we've got the dynamite service for you today, and in that regard, I think that we should be concentrating on Yeshua, and we do concentrate on Yeshua every new moon day, and we do have announcements that are important that we get through the announcements too. And as usual, we've got files upon files upon files. And the reason we're doing this is to help the people, help the people get out of their sinful ways. And a lot of my friends are just plain locked into their sinful, disobedient ways. So, on behalf of my friends, I want to help them understand what God has shown us. So we've had correspondence this week from one fellow that I'd gone to the feast with Actually, I took him to the feast in terms of my vehicle and everything. And we had correspondence with him, trying to help him understand. But he refuses to understand. So here's how the correspondence went last week. And it was all regarding... The ministers need to be rebaptized because they can't understand God's Bible. The ministers can't understand God's Bible. They're supposed to have three feasts a year. Deuteronomy 16, 16, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. That's three. Three, three, three. Now, a fourth grader can count past three and know what three is. So that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. But the ministers can't understand three because they do not keep three feasts a year. They deliberately break God's Bible. They deliberately break Ezekiel 46.3. And that's a fact. They do not have new moon day. They deliberately break Genesis 1.14. Lights shall mark days, not man's phony international dateline. And indeed, they refuse to follow the Bible where it says, Don't learn Mother Goddess Day. Don't learn Sky Father's Day. Don't learn Turkey God Day. Inasmuch as the Bible says, Learn not the way of the Gentiles. Learn not the way the customs of the countries that you go into. After you are freed from the ways of Egypt, you're going right back into the ways of Egypt. And remember, I told you last week, it's even worse than you think with all the Christmas trees up, where the Christmas tree trunk is the penis, and the balls are the testicles, the ball ornaments are the testicles, and the tinsel is the ejaculate, is the ejaculate, and the wreath is the vagina, and that all goes back 4,000 years, 2,000 years before Yeshua was even born. Well, Peter didn't have the spiritual strength to follow Christ, but he was given the Holy Spirit, and then, then, then he could follow Christ. So all these ministers will have to be rebaptized, and that's where I 
had corresponded with my ex-friend and basically he'd asked me do I send these emails to ministers and the answer is yes yes he even sent one registered email to one particular minister that's stated that it's Meredith Living Church of God he hasn't responded to his registered letter he's ignoring it he ignores it and he'll tell all his members he'll go on his broadcast and he'll tell all his members we're the Philadelphian Church of God no you are not because first of all the Philadelphian Church of God is a small group not a hundred thousand and second of all the Philadelphian Church of God is known for its obedience that's why they're Philadelphian and the Living Church of God is not obedient to God's Bible they move God's Sabbath to the sixth day Friday in half the world they refuse to celebrate New Moon Day they refuse to follow Deuteronomy 16 16 what's so hard about that so one of the rebuttals I was given by my ex-friend here it's all his rebuttal was it's all in personal interpretation so what did I respond no it is not personal interpretation a fourth grader knows how many three is three times a year you are to appear before God at three feasts it is lying to say that this is personal interpretation and no liar will enter the kingdom of God Deuteronomy 16 16 states three feasts a year feast of unleavened bread feast of weeks feast of tabernacles if you say anything else you are a liar and then I said to him, you have to obey God's Bible and not your sinister Bible-breaking Brisby. And that refers to John Brisby, a leader of the Church of God, the Eternal, who I had to mark because he was so vehement about him following Armstrong's errors and that Armstrong's errors take precedence over God that I had to mark him because that's horrible saying that you're going to follow the doctrines of Herbert W. Armstrong and disobey the doctrines of God and that includes Pentecost and counting Pentecost and having Pentecost as the Feast of Weeks not the Feast of Sabbaths it's the Feast of Weeks you've got to wait seven times seven 49 plus one day you don't count seven Sabbaths you count seven weeks and the weeks start on the first day of unleavened bread after the first day of unleavened bread you start counting and then you end up at Savannah five six or seven depending on the new moon sightings during the 50 days whether they're 29 days in the month or whether they're 39 days in the month so generally it's the bond six but not necessarily and Herbert Armstrong celebrated Savon six five six or seven in 1934 and then by 1937 Armstrong had fallen off the rails and moved it to a Monday well you can't do that because the Pharisees were in charge of the temple and Yeshua himself celebrated after the order of the Pharisees so therefore all the way till the temple was destroyed after Yeshua was crucified the Pharisees were still in charge of the temple after 31 AD all the way up to um, 64 70 AD before the temple was destroyed that means that the Church of God in the first century the same church that Yeshua attended celebrated Pentecost 
on Savannah 5, 6, or 7. And not on Monday, and not on Sunday, nor on any other day that a man says it has to be counted. And it always lands on Savannah 5, 6, or 7. So in conclusion to this correspondence I have, he says uh, to the answer, but I then said, how dare Brisby and you change days that God sanctified? And I say that to all the ministers. How dare you change the days that God has sanctified? That you change it from three times a year to one time a year for holy convocations. Change the days that God has sanctified. Not to mention moving the Sabbath to Friday. And the response is, Great. Smart Alec response was great, but why worry about anyone else? So if anyone ever asks you or challenges you, great, but why worry about anyone else? Here's your answer. I fight against anyone who is against God's Bible words. Anyone who changes God's Bible. God's enemies are my enemies. These ministers are my enemies because they've changed God's Bible and they refuse to stop changing God's Bible. And they continue to change God's Bible. And I fight against anyone who is against God's Bible words. God's enemies are our enemies. That's the way it is. So he wasn't finished there yet. He said, Finish on the FOTHS, F-O-T-H-S, focus. He said, focus on the FOTHS. Those are like Goths. My answer is, judgment is now on the house of the Lord, not on the FOTHS. So you should be grateful that we, the obedient Church of God, are espousing God's ways and admonishing you to repent all you disobedient bratty churches of God that all want your own ways that's why you're all divided into different congregations because you all want your own ministers ways and I've never seen so many apostles around so it's amazing how many apostles there are you count up all the breakaway churches of God and they're all apostles it's amazing how many apostles? There's, there's more apostles in the year 2012 than there ever were on the face of the earth. But now, all, every minister is an apostle. Not. Every minister is a lying, disobedient brat who will be thrown in the lake of fire through Revelation 21, 27 for teaching lies. They're not apostles, they're liars. Well, this man ended off not replying to judgment is now on the house of the house of the Lord, because that is true, and there is no response to that. Now, some of you wondering what the FOTHS are, F-O-T-H-S. First, we have to tell you what a goth is. Remember, you might see people around on in the stores that are dressed in black clothing, black clothing, and they might have uh, colored, colored hair, like blue hair. Well, the culture of goth developed from punk, punk rock in 1979. And they wear black clothes, and you can tell them for sure, because they've got black nail polish, even the guides, some of them have black nail polish, and they have eyeliner, and most of them dye their hair black. And they listen to Marilyn Manson, which I'm not even going to tell you much about. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you that he dresses up like a woman and does his shtick, his shtick. And there are all types of goths. There are cyber goths. So the, I'm telling you this so you know what's going on in the world. There are cyber goths, and they love plastic, and they love nightclubs in the future. And they wear bright colors as opposed to 
the black. Then there are vampire gods. This is what's going on in the world. Vampire gods, and they're often satanic. And they sometimes have their sex in a coffin. And they, some of them suck blood from their partners. And then there's the romantic goth, dress very elegant, and they wear a lot of velvet and lace, and they aim for a medieval Victorian look, and they still love vampires and poetry. I'm telling you this so you can recognize these people on the street, so you know what's going on, so you're not ignorant of these things, and you're not ignorant of how the whole world has fallen, fallen apart. So now you know something about the Goths as a subculture who choose to dress in black or darker colors and some of them will choose brilliant colors. They don't always wear black, they sometimes will wear the exact opposite, bright, bright colors. Now, what he said, this correspondent, was a thought. Well, to make it in a, in a nutshell, a foth is a phony goth. Is, is a, a foth is a fake goth. So that you know that. And yes, all of these types of people exist. And you'll generally find them as blue hair and safety pins in their face and Always a trench coat. You'll know them for sure when he's wearing his trench coat and it's 90 degrees outside in the summertime and the guy's wearing a tre black trench coat. And they've got spikes and chains and wear dog collars and boots and piercings and eyeliner and white makeup, etc., etc., etc. So now you can know what a foth and a goth are. See, we at the Obedient Church of God are up to date on everything. Everything, everything, everything. On the spiritual and also on the physical. So you'll have safety and protection because you'll know when you run into a foth or a goth because we've explained it to you and you want to avoid them because they're basically satanic. And we give you the information to get you out of the sinful churches. And it's disgraceful to be willfully sinful. And we give you a history of the United States government and an explanation of what's going on in the world so that you know, and we've got to save some time to tell you about this horrible shooting, and we'll just tell you a little bit. First of all, it would not surprise me if that is a PSYOPs operation by the United States government implanting thoughts into the shooter of the 20 children. Because that's very, very, very convoluted how he shot 20 children. His reasoning, what they would have pumped into his brain, transmitted, and yes, they can pump little voices into your brain. So, just so you know, there is technology that you can hear voices in your head if the CIA is shooting the signals, beaming the sh signals through your walls at you. But that's no problem, because all you have to do is apply God's Bible and if it isn't in harmony with God's Bible, and like in this case, tells you to shoot your mother and shoot, go to the school and shoot the children. And the reason he shot the children at the school, because those were, his mother was a teacher, and those were her favorite children. That was her favorite children, so he wanted to kill everything associated with his mother. And it wouldn't surprise me if these evil thoughts were beamed into his head because the U.S. government wants to take away all of our guns so that they can bring in the New World Order. Just like Hitler disarmed the people before he took over with his brown shirts. 
Now, remember I told you about the underwear bomber, that he was actually brought onto the plane, brought through the security process by a CIA agent. He was a CIA dupe, just like Oswald had nothing to do with the assassination of Kennedy. And that's why Jack Ruby shot him, because they had to shut up Oswald. That's why he was shot. And that's why Ruby died of cancer a month later, because they injected Ruby with cancer cells and killed Ruby, so Ruby couldn't spill the beans. Look, we the obedient Church of God know what's going on. We know the truth about Gabby Gifford and Judge Roll, that they were going to go against the Operation Fast and Furious. So the CIA beamed messages into this other nutcase's head, and this other nutcase went out and shot six people, including Judge Roll, shot Judge Roll dead, and shoot, shot Gabby Gifford, Senator Gabby Gifford, Congressman Senator in, in the head. And that was to stop them from going after the Fast and Furious program that they, that Judge Roll was against. And now that we've seen 20 children murdered and seven others, this again smells to high heaven like a CIA ops, another secret ops. And by the way, all of the bombing incidents and terrorist incidents in the United States since 9-11 were in conjunction with the CIA supplying fake bomb parts to the bombers and enticing the bombers. And it's all one big false flag operation in order to have the crackdown on the American people so that they can bring in the new world order. That's what we're seeing. And there's nothing these people will stop at. Ever since the neoconservatives, the banksters, the elites killed Kennedy and we didn't get our pitchforks and torches and burn down the place, government, then they decided they can get away with anything. And indeed, they blew up, the neoconservatives blew up the Twin Towers because the Twin Towers fell at free fall speed. And that cannot happen unless every beam on every floor fails in sequence at exactly the same time and then the building will come down. And that's impossible. Plus all of the concrete was pulverized to dust. The people were all covered in dust. And the only way you can get all that concrete pulverized is through detonation explosions. And it's not me just saying that there are group, a group of a thousand engineers who banded together and said that the buildings were blown up by internal explosives. But you never hear that on the news because the news is controlled by six corporations that are controlled by the neoconservatives and the global elite. So you never hear the truth. The more you listen to network news, Fox News, the dumber you're going to be, the stupider you're going to be. And proven by the facts, 65% of the people that listen to Fox News and Network News believe that Osama bin Laden had something to do with 9-11. And Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with 9-11. Nothing whatsoever. But 65% of, of the people who watched Fox News or NBC or CNBC or ABC News, any of the five conglomerates, People believe that Osama bin Laden had something to do with 9-11 and that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. Saddam Hussein had absolutely nothing to do with 
And the Muslims hated Saddam Hussein. They didn't have any relationship at all. The Sunnis, they couldn't get together from, with Saddam Hussein supporting them because they hated Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein hated them. Yeah. Then you go back to the Mujahideen. You know, they were created by the CIA. And then you have what's known as blowback. Yeah. Now you've got the Taliban. Well, why don't they call them the Mujahideen at the CIA? Because that's who they are. And then you have 100,000 troops in the United in American troops searching for 100 Taliban in Afghanistan. There are only 100 Taliban. But now there are more because of all the persecution of the United States and the drone strikes in Afghanistan where little children are blown up. How would you like a, what would you think of a bomber who went into a house and blew up little children? Well, that's what your United States government does. They blow up the grandmother, they blow up the grandfather, they blow up your mother, and they blow up your children. Except they do it with a drone. And they say it's a surgical strike. No, it's not a surgical strike. They're blowing up the children. The same way that a bomber would come into a house and strap, strap a dynamite pack on a little child and blow up the little child. And I'm emphasizing this because there are 20 children that were just killed. This is what the CIA, this is what the United States government does every day of the week in Afghanistan. It blows up little children, it blows up grandmothers, and calls it a surgical strike. Now that's the truth. That's the truth. They blow up whole houses. They also blow up wedding parties. Just Google the wedding party that was massacred by these by the US Air Force. Yeah, I love the United States. I hate the lying diabolical rulers who are lying to you and making fools out of you. The only solution is Christ coming back. Well, we the obedient Church of God know what's going on in the world. And we know how to handle the truth. And we know how to speak the truth with power. And indeed, we know how to speak truth to power, speaking truth to power to the authorities, so that you know what's going on and know how evil all these people, leaders, are. You know, Netanyahu is a Mason. Shimon Perez is a Mason. Obama is a Satanic Mason. George Bush was skull and bones. Poppy Bush was 33rd degree Mason. We're dealing with a bunch of satanic, demon-worshipping leaders. That's who we're dealing with. We're dealing with one demon after another. Let me give you a little uh, history of the uh, experimentation while we're on the, on the topic. You think the government can't do evil things? They've been doing evil things since 1931. Here's a history of secret experimentation on people that is done by your government. 1931, Dr. Cornelius Rhodes, under the auspices of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Investigations, they deliberately infected humans with cancer cells. He later goes on to establish the U.S. Army Biological Warfare Facilities in Maryland, Utah, and Panama. This is Cornelius Rhodes. While there, he begins a series of radiation exposure experiments on American soldiers and civilian hospital patients. That's right. 1931. 1932, this classic one, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, T-U-S-K-E-G-E-E, -E -E, Syphilis Study. 200 black men that are 
diagnosed with syphilis are never told of their illness, are denied treatment, and are used of, as human guinea pigs in order to follow the progression and symptoms of the disease. They all subsequently die from syphilis. Their families never told that they could have been treated. 1935, the Pellegra incident. Millions of individuals, after millions of individuals die from, the, from Pellegra, the disease Pellegra, over the span of two decades, the U.S. government health service finally acts to stem the disease. That's after millions of individuals dies. The director of the agency admits it had known for at least 20 years that pellagra is caused by a niacin deficiency, but failed to act since most of the deaths occurred within poverty-stricken black populations. Poverty-stricken black populations. This is the U.S. government doing this. 1940. 400 prisoners in Chicago are deliberately infected with malaria in order to study them. Now, the Nazi doctors that were on trial in Nuremberg in 1945, they cited this American study to defend their own actions, to defend their Nazi actions. The Nazi doctors cited this at trial that 400 prisoners in Chicago were infected with malaria deliberately. 19, that's the truth. And the Nazi doctors used that in their defense. This is what you're dealing with. This is, what you're, this is why Christ has to come back. Yeshua has to come back. 1942. Chemical warfare studies begin mustard gas experiments on approximately 4,000 servicemen. The experiments continue until 1945 and made use of Seventh-day Adventists who chose to become human guinea pigs rather than serve on active duty. So you had the choice of either going into the ar army or going into medical studies. Quote, medical studies. Yeah, some medical studies. Mustard gas experiments on 4,000 of the Seventh-day Adventists. 1943. Biolo U.S. begins research on biological weapons at Fort Detrick, Maryland. I'll, I'll sleep this faster. 1944, U.S. Navy subjects humans, Americans, to test gas, to test gas masks and clothing. Individuals were locked in a gas chamber and exposed to mustard gas. And this is under the guise of, of scientific experiment. Here's a real good one. Project Paperclip. Pro 1945. Project Paperclip. The U.S. State Department, Army Intelligence, and the CIA recruit, recruit Nazi scientists and offer them immunity and secret identities in exchange for work on top secret government U.S. projects in the United States. They brought the Nazi scientists in. Project Paperclip. Google that. 1945, Program F is implemented by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. And I'll condense this because it's kind of long. And one of, they had an extensive study on the health effects of fluoride, fluoride, which was a key chemical component in atomic bomb production. One of the most toxic chemicals known to man, fluoride, it is found caused marked adverse effects to the central nervous system, but much of the information is squelched in the name of national security because of fear that lawsuits would undermine full-scale production of atomic bombs. We're talking fluoride, fluorocytic acid, which the Nazis put in the water of the German prisoners in order to make the prisoners, the Jewish prisoners, more docile. They put fluoride in the water. The same fluoride that your government puts in your water. And the government doesn't care a hoot about your teeth. They wanted to dumb down the population after 1945 because all the men coming back from the war were some of them were so violent that they put the United States government put fluoride in everybody's drinking water in order to calm down the population. 
1947, U.S. government, Chagas Canensis, is putting intravenous doses of radioactive substances into human subjects. 47, you're like this one. The CIA begins its LSD experiments on, again, human subjects, civilian and military, without their knowledge. And how they do this, because I know a lot about these studies, is they get the subjects to sign a release that they will participate, but the subjects in their signature are told they won't be told when they're going to be experimented on or what they're going to be experimented on with. And that's how they get around it, the government gets around it without lawsuits. And in 1950, they were detonating nuclear weapons to monitor downwind residents for mortality. Unbelievable. 1950, an experiment to der determine how susceptible an American city would be to biological attack. The U.S. Navy sprays a cloud of bacteria from ships over San Francisco. Many residents become ill with pneumonia-like symptoms. 1951, Department of Defense, open-air testing using disease-producing bacteria and viruses. Tests last through 1969 of the U.S. government exposing people directly to bacteria and viruses in the open air. Now, you'll like this one. They even do this to other countries. In 1953, the U.S. military released clouds of zinc, cadmium, C-A-D-M-I-U-M, sulfide gas over Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, over St. Louis, Louis, Minneapolis, Fort Wayne, the Monocry River Valley in Maryland, M-O-N-O-C-A-C-Y, and Leesburg, Virginia. Their intent was to disperse how efficiently they could disperse chemical agents. I've got pages of this stuff. There's too much to read because we've got to give you more spiritual information. But I've got them releasing chemicals and doing evil deeds in 53, 1953, 1955, 1956, over Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I'll just condense this really. Um, 1958, 1960, 1965. Oh, you like this one. Uh, Project CIA. 1965 Project CIA and the Department of Defense begin Project MK Search. And I know of another program called MK Ultra, but you'd better start on startpage.com before you even put in the words in your search MK Ultra because you're going to be tracked. Anyways, 1965 begins Project MK Search to manipulate human behavior through mind altering drugs. And this guy, kid, 20-year-old kid who shot up the 20, killed the 27 people, killed the 20 people, was a nutcase, and he was on drugs. They could have dosed up his drugs. 1965, prisoners were subjected to dioxin. That's from the same as Agent Orange component of Agent Orange, and they were studied. 1966, CIA initiates Prof. Project MK Often. Again, drugs on unsuspecting humans. Well, I can't read all these pages. If you're interested, uh, send me an email, and I can email the history of the U.S. secret experimentation. And this goes down 67, 68, 69, 70, 70, 75, 77, 78, and 81, where they're all, ex US, your U.S. government experimenting on unsuspecting citizens. 
1980, 1980, 1500 six-month-old babies in Los Angeles are given measles deliberately. Experim are given an experimental measles vaccine that had never been licensed for use in the United States. CDC later admits that the parents were never informed that the vaccine being injected into their children was experimental. 1994, they're doing gene tracking. 1994 again, they using military personnel exposing them to nerve gas, ionizing radiation, psychochemicals, hallucinogens, and drugs. 1994, 1995, exposing people to biological warfare agents. 1995, they're doing it to prisoners. 1996, they're using it to the, doing it to the Desert Storm. People exposed to the chemical agents of de devils. Desert Storm. These devils are doing it to the soldiers again. And 1997, 88 members of Congress signed a letter demanding an investigation into bioweapons use and the Gulf War syndrome. But nothing came of that. That's what's really going on, and that's why you need Yeshua to return. Because your government is destroying you by these false flag operations. I don't want to spend any more time on that. What we've got here is that you should know about New Moon Day. We we. For the new listeners out there, new, this being New Moon Day, I wanted to mention this, that the New Moon actually has to be cited by human, humans, witnesses, human witnesses. So this time on December the 14th in Israel, with the four witnesses, you have to have at least two, but this time they had, looks like, six witnesses. No, they had five. They had the... Yoel Halevi, H-A-L-E-V-I, Y-O-E-L, at, at 4.54. And at 5.05 p.m., they had Randy Bohr, B-O-E-R, Arena Bohr, and Jacob Bohr all cited it at 5.05. So that's how the new moon is cited. Happy Rosh Kodesh. Happy New Moon Day. In conclusion, with the 27 people being gunned down, you're powerless. Bear note, you're powerless unless you have a gun. And you have God's protection, yes, in certain situations, but not in all situations. The problem was, none of the teachers had a gun to shoot him dead, to shoot the 20-year-old madman dead. None of the teachers had a gun. That was the problem. Now, back on the home front, the big banks are still getting 42% of all the profit in the other, in the United States. And um, let's intersperse here so we don't miss this. Our third tithe year starts on the holy days, springtime holy days of 2013. Third tithe year starts this spring on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, actually, on the 14 days prior to the Passover, on Aviv 1. Aviv 1. That's when the third tithe year starts. The next third tithe year will be 2016. And then you'd have the year of release, which is 2017. 
That's how the count goes. So you can prepare for that and adjust your finances for that. That's so much here that we've got. We're just going to have to bypass this and save this for another time on the announcements regarding the wars going on in the world. One thing I do want to tell you about the land of Israel. You hear it first on the obedient church of God. The land of Israel shall not be given away, shall not be sold. Who said that? God said that. Leviticus 25 and verse 23. So that everyone can understand regarding the Palestinian situation what God says. Well, let's all turn to Leviticus 25 and see what God says regarding giving land to the Palestinians who aren't Palestinians, they're just a bunch of Arab squatters calling themselves Palestinians. Leviticus 25, verse 23. And this is another rediscovered truth because I've never heard a minister state this. I'm going to underline it in my Bible. Verse 23 of Leviticus 25. The land shall not be sold. Is that any clearer? And then there's the word permanently, because remember we were discussing the year of release. The land shall not be sold. Who does the land belong to? Dot, dot. For the land is mine, says God. The land is mine. And this regards, you can look this up later so you know that the, that the statutes of the Lord are the seven years and basically you can read it after services for yourself in Leviticus 25. The point that we're making here we can knock out the Palestinians claim in one verse the land shall not be given away shall not be sold Leviticus 25:23. Well, they've sold it. So God's taking his blessing away from the people of Israel and indeed from all of the 12 tribes who are all part of this. And we now know that Israel, Jerusalem, will become a burdom, burdom, some stone. That's right. Israel will become a burden, some stone around the necks of all of the eight of all of the nations. Let's see what Jeremiah twelve for all the listeners to know that this dispute in Israel and all the trouble in Israel is going to keep on going on. Zechariah twelve verses two to three. Zechariah twelve verse two. Behold I will make Jerusalem a cup cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. So that's what can, what's going to be happening, a siege of Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day, which means in that day, whenever the Bible says that, that's the end time day, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. And all who would mess with it will be surely cut in pieces. So that's what's going to happen. The United States is going to be cut in pieces because it's messing with Jerusalem. So it's good to put in the vernacular so that you can understand that the United States is messing with Jerusalem. And that the United States would be cut to pieces and will surely be cut to pieces. There you have it for all you new listeners out there. And we love the United States. 
that we hate, the Masonic order that's running the United States. And the city of Jerusalem, by the way, if you want your future or know the future, it's going to be trodden down by the Gentiles. Luke 21, 24. You might as well read it, because we're on the topic of Jerusalem, and that's going to be involving the whole world. So let's, let's see what Luke says. Luke 21, verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is going to be the future of Jerusalem. And it's going to be horrendous. Tiny little Israel, tiny little Jerusalem will be a burden, some stone. The world's greatest burden. Bear note, do you know that Israel has only one one thousandth of the earth's population? Only one one thousandth of the earth's population. And everybody's so concerned about little tiny Israel, one one thousandth of the Earth's population. That's because the devil is involved in this, and Christ is going to return to the Mount of Olives. So that is, bear note, this is why Lucifer is messing with Jerusalem. So he can have the false Christ, bear note, so he can have the false Christ sit in the holy place and declare himself to be Christ. That's why nobody knows, nobody's asked themselves why all this kerfuffle about Jerusalem? Who cares who owns the city? It's only a tiny little place. There are border disputes all over the world. In many countries, in Africa, all over, you know. You've got Taiwan, you got all kinds of, why all this focus on tiny little Jerusalem? Answer. Because Satan wants Jerusalem, so he can have the impersonation of Christ, Yeshua, returning there. So here we've got a situation that's setting up for big time trouble. If you go to Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3, we're, we're back to it that it will be a heavy stone. A heavy stone. Now, how bad is it going to be? Read verse 6. Better read verse 6. They don't read. Ministers don't read verse 6 or tell you about verse 6. God is going to make the governors of the Jews like a torch and devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and left. So that means to me nuclear war. The governors, the leaders of Judah are going to unleash a nuclear holocaust. So in where it says leaders, where it says governors of Judah, put leaders. Leaders of Israel, where you see Israel, where you see Judah, put Israel, so you understand this. So above it, Judah, put Israel, so then read it. In that day I will make the leaders of Israel like a fire pan in the wood pile, like a fiery torch. So condense it. Leaders of Israel, a torch. Then underline, shall devour surrounding peoples, nuclear war. Now Israel has 600 nuclear warheads on missiles, and Israel not only says they're going to use them, Israel has vowed, vowed that Israel will use nuclear weapons. 
And Israel had said, never again like the Holocaust of 1940s. It will go nuclear. And it has vowed, Israel has vowed, vowed, vowed to go nuclear. And that fits as your explanation of Zechariah 12, 6. In verse 6, leaders, governors of Judah, Israel, dot, 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 will be a torch, shall devour the surrounding people, shall devour the surrounding people, torch, you can put nuclear. So if you think any peace talks are going to work, no, they're not. They're not going to work according to the Bible. And indeed, Damascus will be blown off the face of the earth. What's happening right now is that Damascus is, Assad is being overthrown. It's taking this long because Russia said, when it's not reported on network news, Putin said that if the United States uses air power like the United States did in Libya against Gaddafi, the United States would be blown off the face of the earth by the Russians. That's the deal that you weren't told why this is taking so long going on in with the Assad regime, why it's dragging on and on in Syria. Because the United States is scared to use the air power because Russia told them not to. You heard it first on the Obedient Church of God. We know what's going on in the world. We don't want to spend any more time, but now you know that the Bible says that God says the land is mine, it shall not be given to the Palestinians. And if you want to mess around with God's law, you're going to serve the king of Babylon. Jeremiah 25, 3 to 11. We haven't got time to go there. But that's where you're going to end up with serving the king of Babylon in the former New World Order. And you're making your own pit. You go to Psalm 9, don't blame God, it's your doing, you neoconservative Masons. Psalm 9 and Wolfowitz, the doctrine of taking over the whole world. Psalm 9, verse 15. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made, they made, in the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. And that's what's going to be happening in Jerusalem. They're going to get caught in their own net. And it ends up in verse 16 saying, meditate on that. Salah, think about that. So the United States is going to get caught in its own net. Three cities are going to be blown up in the United States. New York, L.A., and Washington, D.C. Sad state of affairs. You know that uh, way back the solution was given to Israel, but way back in 47, that the, the Arabs were offering, were, bear note, just so you know, 82% of the land of Israel was offered to the Arabs. 82% of the country of Israel was offered to the Arabs, but the Arabs refused. And that was in 1947. The Arabs rejected 82% of Israel being given to them because 18% of Israel was to be given to the Jews, a pretty little 18%. And the land of Israel is only 40 miles across, it's tiny. This is a sliver of a land. So in 1947, 82% of Israel, the whole land, was to be given to the Arabs. But the Arabs refused. That's how we're getting into this mess. The Arabs want it, want it all. So don't let anyone disguise the fact that 82% of Israel was to be given to the Arabs.
I think that was the resolution 181, and I've been making Jerusalem an international city. We don't have time to go into all of, any more of that. You never hear any of the truth because all of the corporations are warmongers like NBC. Bear note, NBC is owned by General uh, Electric. And what does General Electric do? It makes warm, war, it makes tanks and war materials. And NBC is owned by a warmonger. So of course you'll never hear any of the truth or any of the correct interpretations. Oh, and be, regarding interpretations, you want to understand that how the U.S. will be destroyed will be by the little horn, the little horn, destroying three of the ten horns. We told you that, that the United States, Canada, then Britain and France in another block, and then New Zealand, Australia in another block, three of the horns will be plucked up at the instigation of the little horn. And that's how the United States, Britain, France, New Zealand, Australia will be destroyed by the other seven horns. And no other church knows that. No other church knows that. So you heard it first here on the Obedient Church. You better put that on your wall so that when you can see that happen, that the three, three horns that will be plucked up are Canada and the U.S. That's the first horn. The next horn is France and the Scandinavian countries, Britain. And then the next group, New Zealand, Australia. Now we've got to get into Christ and his character, because we have that on New Moon Day. Very important to go over Yeshua's character, because that involves your character. Now, Jesus was led up by the Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness. Matthew 4, verse 1. And now the wilderness is a large, barren area. A large, barren area. Now, now first we better clarify scripture for you. Because the scripture says in Mark 1, verse 10, that after his baptism, here's another rediscovered truth, bear note. After his baptism, Jesus went to the desert where he was tempted. Mark 1, verse 10. But John 1, 29 says, after his baptism, Jesus went to Cana in Galilee to attend a marriage supper. How do you rationalize that with Mark 1, verse 10? Well, let's explain this for you. The passage in John 1.29 must be read carefully because of small details are of great importance to the understanding of verse 29. Verse 29 mentions the next day, which is the following the day following the events just mentioned in the verses before, when some of the Jews came to John questioning him, then John the Baptist mentions to the Jews which had come to him that he, that this was Jesus of whom he had spoken previously. Now in verse 32, very important and decisive words are spoken by John. Now this will help put this section in its proper place. And here it says, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. John speaks in the past tense. I saw it. Past tense. Not I see it, but I saw it. When he reported what had happened at the baptism of Jesus. So this day, 
when John was telling this to the Jews was not the day that it happened, but the day had already come and gone. This was already past. This is when we read in the next verses in John 1, we can recognize that some more days went by, and after that, Jesus later left from there together with some new disciples who had previously, who had been previously disciples of John, and they went to a wedding in Canaan, in Galilee. So more days went by. Jesus was baptized. Here's a sequence of events. Jesus was baptized and immediately was driven out into the wilderness by the Spirit. When he came back, when Jesus had came, come back, then he went to the wedding in Canaan. Now that should clarify it for any of the naysayers out there. And that's important so that you can understand there aren't any contradictions in the Bible. Okay, we'll leave that there and move on here. The issue is 40 days in the wilderness. Now, the number 40 is very familiar to everyone. It should be. Remember Noah and the flood. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Genesis 7, verse 4, verse 12, verse 17. Genesis 8, verse 6. Here, remember the, the covenant being sealed with Moses on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus 24, 18. Remember when the prophet Elisha, Elijah is pursued by Queen Jezebel. He flees, Elijah flees, and he travels 40 days and nights. 1 Kings 19, verse 8. Remember in Jesus, now we're in the New Testament, in the desert, 40 days and 40 nights. And his ascension to heaven occurs 40 days after his resurrection. Acts 1, verse 3. Now, Yeshua was 40 days in the wilderness. Now, watch out, because the wilderness, in my research, showing in the region of Canaan, the bear note, is a special evil god by the name of Mot, M-O-T. And the evil god Mot was in charge of that hot, dry, barren place in the wilderness. And... A wilderness is basically where there's, an, it's a negative place, it's a, there, nothing grows there. And in that place of death, the power of death, the god Mot, held control. So not only is Jesus tempted in the wilderness, Jesus is tempted in an area where this evil, powerful, death god, Mot, holds sway over the area. Now if you look at Jesus' life, Yeshua's life, he was tempted a number of times throughout his ministry. Remember how he was tempted, Yeshua was tempted, even at his crucifixion. Yeshua was tempted to come down off the cross. He was taunted. If you're the Son of God, come down off that cross. So right up to his death, Yeshua was tempted. Now Yeshua was tempted right at the start, the testing. The testing of Yeshua, of Yeshua's temptation. Right after his baptism. Now, this place of testing in the wilderness was also a place where Israel was tested in its faithfulness to Yahweh. And Israel repeatedly failed. Repeatedly failed. But Yahweh, ye, Jesus, succeeded. Now, 
What were the tests? What were the tests that Yahweh was tested with? And Israel was tested too. Bear note, understanding parallel here, no food. They had nothing to drink. Remember, God provided the Israelites with water from the rock. Exodus 17, verses 2 to 7. So Yeshua had no water for 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites, they didn't have any food. God sent them manna, manna in Exodus 16. And this brings to mind about the rock that we just mentioned of Exodus 17, verses 2 to 7. Bear note, why was Jesus, Yeshua, beaten, scourged twice so that he was unrecognizable as a human being? And you can go on our internet site, on the top boxes, Kiddish, click on that and you can see the body of Yeshua, how it was beaten and all the skin was ripped off so that the bones were showing. But why was Yeshua beaten twice? Answer, because Moses hit the rock twice. No one's told you that, why Yeshua had to be beaten twice. That's why Father was so upset, because Moses hit the rock twice. So that means Yeshua had to be beaten twice. Look folks, come into the safety, protection and knowledge of the obedient Church of God. We've got so many rediscovered truths, we haven't even written them all down. We must have nearly 200 now. We've got for sure 130 understandings that no one else has. So now you know why Yeshua had to be beaten twice, to fulfill prophecy where Moses struck the rock twice. All right. Well, in the wilderness, you're in an, in an extreme place. And that means that, by that very fact, choices are more clear-cut. Food and water are essential. Security is an extreme threat. And you have legitimate needs. So the wilderness was a place of threats against your life and the Israelites were tested to see if in fact they would truly believe that God would carry them through there and that's what you've got to believe that in your trials and whatever is going on that God will carry you through as long as you remain obedient to him You have God's assurance of God's presence when you're in the spiritual wilderness. And Yeshua never wavered in his close relationship to Father. And we are assured, just like Yeshua was assured by the dove descending on him, we are assured that we are not alone that God is with us. And I can prove that from Matthew 1, 23. We are in, indeed assured that I am always with you, even until the end of the age. So, to cheer us up, because times are going to be very, very hard now, coming up as January 1st, December 31st, when they're going to crash the economy by... May, no, I had it down as March, I have to check my notes, March the 20th, somewhere around that time, they're going to crash the economy. But back on your hope, in the midst of your struggles, your temptations, your journeys, do you really believe that Yeshua, that God the Father is with you? So you're in a spiritual wilderness now, but you are being nurtured by God. And he said, And behold, I am with you always, until the end of the age. Matthew 28, verse 20. So you're in a spiritual wilderness right now, just like the Israelites 
were in a physical wilderness. And the Israelites were saved out of it. The Israelites were saved out of the physical wilderness. Now, with the contrast between the glory, I want to contrast the glory following Yeshua's baptism and the challenge to be tempted by the devil. So, when Yeshua was baptized, he was baptized in the cool waters of the Jordan. But now he's in a hot, hot, barren, scorching wilderness of Satan. Now before Yeshua had huge crowds following him. But now he's out in the wilderness and there's solitude and silence. Number three, the Spirit rested on him like a calm dove. But now the Spirit drives him, forces him into the wilderness. Four, the voice of the Father calling him his beloved Son, comforting him at his baptism. But now we've got the hiss of Satan the tempter attacking him. Which brings up point five. Yeshua was anointed by God, but now he's attacked, attacked by Satan. And first seven here, we got two, three, four, five, it's actually point six. The water of baptism first, and now the fire of temptation. And point seven, first the heavens opened, and now it's hell with the devil. There's a remarkable contrast between the glory following Jesus' baptism, and indeed our baptism, and then this season of us to be in the wilderness, to be harassed by the devil, tempted by the devil, and tested, well, indeed tested by the devil. Now, the, a, a far better translation for you to write in your Bible would be testing instead of temptation, because God can't be tempted. Yeshua couldn't be tempted. There was no contest. Couldn't be tempted. You know, by being tempted, that means you consider something as uh, delectable and you get, in, get your feet dirty. It's just like stepping on something. Even if you step on something that's bad, you still get your shoes dirty. So this, I'd like you to use the word testing instead of tempting. And indeed, uh, according to Barclay, it means to test. And it means more to test than to tempt. Now, we, being in the spiritual wilderness, are going to be tested and tested by the devil. It's a certainty for all of us in the spiritual wilderness. Yet Jesus, Yeshua's temptation was more severe. Why? Because Jesus was tempted by the devil directly, directly by the devil himself. Remember, I said that there was a demon by the name of Moth that was controlling that land. Got that in my notes here somewhere. And but Jesus, Yeshua, wasn't just de dealing with the demon devil named Mot, M O T. Jesus was now face to face with Lucifer, Satan. And he was being to this tested severely by the devil himself. Now, to cheer you up, we contend with lesser demons. Not that that is a picnic, but we contend with lesser demons. And Yeshua, our hero, had to contend 
with Lucifer directly. Let's pray that we never have to. So, how did Yeshua and how should we approach this? If you read, you'll find out that it was said that when the tempter came to him, if you're the Son of God, command these stones be turned into bread. But he answered, said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So the point is, think up a scripture, what the scripture says when you are tempted. When somebody does something mean and nasty to you, remember that you should love your enemies. That doesn't mean you love what they do. And by the way, you're supposed to forgive your enemies. But bear note, but that doesn't mean you stupidly forget what your enemies do and walk back into the same disaster again with the same enemies. You remember what they did to you. You remember Amalek. You forgive them. You forgive them. But you remember what they did. And I personally will deliberately stay away from some people. I've forgiven them. But I will stay away from them, though I have forgiven them. So notice how the tempter came to, to Yeshua, because we should consider the circumstances preceding the temptation of Christ. So before Christ was tempted, Christ was in a perfectly devout state of mind. And he was in, engaged in an act of obedience. He was obeying his father and going for a jaunt, some jaunt, a jaunt in the wilderness. So first of all, he was in a devout frame of mind. The spirit had just descended on him. He was going on an act of obedience to his father out in the wilderness. And he was given the blessed assurance of sonship before he was driven out into the wilderness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit before temptation, just like you and I are. Filled, filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit. And he was completely separate from the world before his temptation. He had gotten out of the world. He had gotten out of the worldly ways. He didn't celebrate Turkey God Day, which was around for 4,000 years. He didn't celebrate Mother Goddess Day, which was around for 4,000 years. He didn't celebrate Turkey God Day, Sky Father's Day, Mother Goddess Day. Now, if you're a son of God, the question asked by Satan is more literally to Yeshua. You, since you are the son of God, instead of if you are the son of God, so Satan was not questioning Jesus' deity, he challenged Yeshua to prove or demonstrate his deity to command these stones. Yet, yeah, right. And more literally in the translations, the question asked by Satan more literally is, since you are the Son of God, since you are the Son of God, command these. So, in conclusion, Yeshua passed all the tests. Sonship was given to Yeshua, Jesus. And that means that certainly Jesus and we have the power to resist sin. And we are living in a spiritual wilderness and Yeshua would not command that these stones become bread Jesus toughed it out in the spiritual wilderness for 40 days and for 14 nights. And Jesus proved his sonship by obeying God. And we have to prove our sonship in this spiritual wilderness by obeying God. And we will have human wants, and we will have needs, just like Yeshua needed bread and water. 
But we will not have Turkey God Day. We will not have Mother Goddess Day. We will not have Sky Father's Day. We will obey every jot and tittle of God's law so that we in the spiritual wilderness can show Father that he can trust us. See, some ministers don't even know what the spiritual wilderness is. The spiritual wilderness is Sky Father's Day, Mother Goddess Day, Turkey God Day. Bear note, write it down as a bear note. That's part of the spiritual wilderness, that you'll have nothing to do to be tempted in the spiritual wilderness. So that you can prove to Father that you will obey every word of his Bible. And you can be, can be, will be one of his. Well, I hope this strengthens you. Remember, the disciples, they immediately left their nets. They left everything behind. And they followed. And it says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So guess what? If you follow Yeshua, you're going to be made a member of his church that helps fish for men. That's what you wish Yeshua said in closing. Yeshua said, I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I'm just going to let you sit around and worship me. He says, I will give you a job. I will make you fishers of men. So all you members of the obedient church of God know that you've got a job to do to be fishers of men in your participation in the obedient church of God. You are in the spiritual wilderness and once you pass the tests of the spiritual wilderness throughout your life, you will be given a crown. And that's a crown of righteousness to show, identify you as one of God's. And he will make you fishers of men, just like Yeshua was. Yeshua passed the tests in the physical wilderness. You are going to pass your tests in the spiritual wilderness. And just like Yeshua, you will be a fisher of men. And that's a brief summation of Yeshua's character on our special New Moon Day, where we always put the emphasis on Yeshua and his character. Out of time, totally. In fact, we're three minutes over time. We're three minutes over time. And the phones just went off. And since we want you to obey and worship God, it's very important to put the phone back, hook up back on. Very important. Put in the codes. Mm. Gotta do it again. Gotta wait. There we go. Oh, phone's not cooperating. One moment, please. We have to wait till their software is ready. There we go. All right. Why do we take the time to do that and break into our video transmission? Because it's important to praise God, and we want everyone singing out together and praising God. And there's no reason why the phone should be knocking itself off the circuit. Nothing moved, and it just went off the circuit by itself. So we just carry on in the spiritual wilderness against all the machinations that go on around us. Now, we are going to close out our hymns.
soon as I can get the cooperation of the computer here. And it will be, well, there you go, the hymn has disappeared. So we got two things. We got the phone lines down and we got the uh, phone lines are back. And we've got the hymn that just, just disappeared. So we will pull up another hymn. Because we want to obey God. We've got to click out of a few boxes here. As time goes on, but we're not going to relent. We are going to continue. So, one moment please, while we type in a few commands for the computer. And we bring up this particular him. And I think we're, we're going to sing Save Me, O God, by Thy Great Name, because that's our only hope, even with all of these manifestations going on right now. Bear with me while I'm typing in some commands here. It'll be well worth it because we're using it to praise, praise Father and Yeshua by their all that they've done for us, all that they have done for us. They are worthy of the praise. So we'll try one more time because we're really getting problems with this computer. It's just the way life is going. So we're going to open another browser window. And we know what we're doing, so just hit enter. And we're praying that the computer doesn't hang up. Hang, as in just plain hang. And here we go. I think we're going to um, go with, or teach me that I may know, because we are in the spiritual wilderness. So I'll sing out, Lord, teach me that I may know. together were magnificent cut off all my foes destroy them they which do afflict my soul you petitioned father to do that for you perfect Jim so now remain standing face the north heavens it bowed eyes closed 
Almighty, most merciful, loving Father, our Father, who art in heaven, with Yeshua at your right hand side, we pray for your kingdom to come, as that is the only hope, and that your will be done on earth by us, your obedient children in the obedient Church of God. Please call in the others into the obedient Church of God knowledge so that they individually can be obedient as you require. Don't let people go into severe trials. It's coming up, terrible time in the world. It's December 31st, collapse, social funds. So deliver the people from the evil that's coming on this world. Father, we love you, and though you slay us, we will obey and follow you. Thank you for your knowledge, and thank you for your way of life, which is a happy, abundant way of life with good food and good nutrition and following your health laws. We thank you for all of the knowledge you give the obedient Church of God, and we thank you for the wonderful members you've put in the obedient Church of God. We're grateful for those members. So now, Father, then the week is coming. It's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. And cut off all our foes. Defend us. Because we have got a lot of issues going on with the government right now. So, Father, cut off all our foes in the government and defend us. Now, Father, we put ourselves in the hollow of your hand for another week and ask this all in Yeshua HaMashiach's holy righteous name, our soon arriving King of the universe, that we will put our faith in with you, the King of the world, Yeshua, and the King of the universe, you. And our faith is in you. We ask it all in Yeshua's holy righteous name. Amen. Yes, indeed. Quite a broadcast, but never, never let up. And that's one of the important things of being a Christian. And also to trust and obey. So we want you to trust God. And we want you to obey God. We want you to be one of His. And only the obedient are one of His. And that's the service for today. Whoa.